Hi there Grounder School, this is Cowthers, coming at you today with the long awaited start of the package entitled player types and adjusting to them. So, or adjusting to player types, I have it here, whichever. So, hopefully you've been looking forward to this and you checked out my short last time, where what I did was I went through and I explained to you guys what we were going to be covering in this series. Um, I said we we're going to be starting off with episode 2, Nets and Exploiting Them. This is the first full length video in the package, so we're going to be talking a bit about that today. And then there's plenty of other good stuff to look forward to, hopefully, um, about dealing with stations, dealing with short stacks, targeting weak players, maniacs, tags, lags, how to spot different player types, and a bit about table selection. So the idea behind this from us is that by the end of it, you'll be like really, really competent in the area that the package has been on. And as you can probably tell in the site right now, there are other instructors. Who are running other packages and um, if these initial packages go well we're then going to be launching even more and our plan is you know we've made lots and lots of videos in the past loads of live play videos scattered videos random topics here and there we have like a huge sort of archive to work your way through and pick up lots of different concepts but the thought behind this is that if you really want to focus on one thing in particular then we have a package for that we have an extensive you know very comprehensive long series about that topic so by the end of you watching all these videos for instance in, in this case you should emerge at the end of it being very very competent at categorizing players and then adjusting accordingly and you should be able to it should increase your win rate in the 6 max game that you play basically I mean this is maybe even useful for people who don't play 6 max but I should probably make it clear that this is basically a 6 max series because it comes from myself as you're aware I'm a 6 max instructor 6 max is my game so when I talk about nits and when I talk about stations um, and when I talk about fish and I talk about what stats are relevant for each they're going to be based on a 6 handed table so that's just something to bear in mind just feel I should throw that disclaimer in now just in case you're like a full ring player who is looking forward to this but I mean there's still lots for you to gain out of it but yeah I don't talk about full ring stats in any of these videos so Okay, so nets and exploit them is the topic for today. <coughs> there we go. What we're going to be talking about today is how to exploit nets and how to observe nets and make sure that you've actually got a net when you tag someone green or whatever color it is you happen to use for them. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the VPIP and PFR range. I talked about this a little bit in the last um, in the introductory short, episode 1 of the package, that we're going to be looking at this in two kind of ways. <coughs> There'll be sort of we're gonna break we're gonna break it up into four parts basically. There'll be other stuff thrown in in different topics, but a generic topic will be broken up into four parts. The first two will be how to identify the player type, and that'll be segregated into a sort of stats-based approach like VPIP and PFR, like we're gonna use here, and then an observable behavior approach, which is more for you know someone who doesn't play loads and loads of tables, doesn't rely as heavily on their HUD and actually sort of sits and pays really close attention to the table. This would also benefit a live player a lot more, the observable behaviours, because of course you don't have VPIP and preflop raise <coughs> um, and when you're playing live. So when I say VPIP PFR range, we're talking about like the sort of the range of VPIP PFR ratio that a net would fall into, what would count as a net, you know, per se and what wouldn't. But we do have to be a bit careful in that because Sometimes there will be people with really, really nitty tendencies that are maybe a bit looser pre-flop, or there might be people who are really tight pre-flop but have crazy tendencies post-flop. So it's not like black and white, it's just a guideline. So then we're going to talk about observable behaviours. Just for the first video, I'll talk a little bit about what these are. This is things like how frequently do you see them just, you know, take it, take X line. Like how often does someone limp before the flop? How often does someone raise a c-bet on the flop, how often does someone fold to a c-bet, like these are just things that you can pick up without having to look at a HUD, so it's like observable behaviours as well. <clears throat> and then we've got pre-flop strategy, um, how do we exploit nets before the flop, what sort of things do we do, maybe we make our open sizes smaller, maybe we open more to steal their blinds, these sort of things. Post-flop strategy, how do we manipulate the fact that a net is very tight after the flop as well, um, and how do we exploit that. And then what I'm going to do is take you guys through an example of someone's stats that I have on my Holder Manager um, hand history replayer, just like a reg that I play with, who I would definitely 
categorised as a knit, but who may not fall into all of the sort of conditions that we've set out in the video. And the point behind that is really just me trying to illustrate that, you know, there's a bit more finesse to it than just following a general chart when you're categorising a player. Um, if you think someone's nitty, it can be based on a lot of things like how they play post flop or other stats, you know, other than VPEP and PFR. We different stats that can all contribute to how you categorise someone. And I'm also going to show you guys an example hand um, played with this guy, just of like how I'm sort of reacting before the flop and stuff, and then a little bit of post flop as well. But it's not like a hugely exciting spot, it's just sort of to cement and reinforce what I've been talking about in the video. So the VPIP PFR of a net is typically going to have a smaller gap than that of, you know, a fish or a maniac or even a lot of tags or legs. So you're generally never going to see a net who's like 19 two or something like that like this is very rare that would be like a loose passive net who's like a sort of sub breed and we're not really going too much into that in this series but we are going to be talking about nets and we are going to be talking about passives so you can sort of put the two together but generally a tight player that we'd call a net is going to be very much sort of raise or fold for the most part you get the occasional uber net who is like who runs maybe nine one and it's just absurd i've seen these guys I was watching my girlfriend play at 5 and L, and I don't normally play 5 and L, so I'm not used to seeing this at all, but there was a player who actually ran 5, no, what was it, 4-1 over, like, hundreds and hundreds of hands. Like, that's just insanity. Like, he's only raising pocket aces, and he's, like, limping kings, queens, and jacks, and stuff like that. It's just madness. But, yeah, these guys are few and far between. Most nets that you come across are going to be, like, you know, somewhere between like 17, 15, 16, 14, 15, 12, and 6 max, these are very tight VPIP PFR ratios. So anyone who's running like, you know, 13, 10 and stuff, you can very safely call a net because they're just folding so much. It means that they're folding stuff like probably like ace 10 in the cutoff and like king queen in the cutoff and just hands that you should always be opening. Because if, they're, if their preflop raise is that low, and the repip is that low, it just means they're never cold calling out a position and they're hardly opening enough hands, so you can definitely call them a net. Um, do be careful about where the net is opening, like a guy could be 15-12, but his button opening range might be really wide, so you shouldn't just assume by looking at someone's VPIP and PFR, hopefully this goes without saying, but you shouldn't just assume that they're really nitty and tag them as and think that they have a nitty range on the button. You know, nets can open up their game in late position and still be nets, or they can be completely unpositionally aware, um, on the other hand, and just sort of be opening the same range from all positions. So it's definitely worth hovering over, going into your pop-up, and checking where the guy is opening wide and where he's a bit tighter. So a net will typically not be 3-betting very much at all. His 3-bet will be like somewhere around sort of 3 or 4% is a very low 3-bet. If a guy is 3-betting like 3%, it basically means that there's no bluffs in there. It's usually just going to be value like jacks plus, ace-king, maybe like 10s and ace-queen, but usually not. I mean, a 3% three 3-bet, three is there's just no room for there to be any bluffs in there. So remember that 3-bet takes a good amount of hands to actually converge into something too meaningful. You know, you're going to need like sort of 50 to 100 hands at the very least. Um, but... Generally, a net is not going to have a 3-bit bluffing range. If someone's 3-bit bluffing, I'd be inclined to say that they're not a net, even if they are a very tight pre-flop. So, like, one of the requirements, if you like, for me tagging someone as a net is that they're not getting really out of line pre-flop, because that's just not something that a net would do. Um, they fold their blinds a lot, and this is one of the most exploitable parts of nets, and one of the reasons that you want, you actually want them to your left. Like, most of the time when you're taking advantage of a player, you know, you're very happy for them to sit on your right. If it's a fish, you, he gets to limp into the pot, and then you can isolate him, you have position on him post-flop. But with a net, you just really want him to be in the blinds when you have the button, because being able to steal all those blinds is just absolutely huge. That's going to have a very large impact on your win rate. So a net is going to fold his big blind to steal, like, 85% of the time plus, maybe even, like, 90%. And the small blind, that can be absurdly high. Like, nets are generally, most people are generally tighter in the small blind than they are in the big blind. You know, they have a player to act after them, so they get squeezed more, and they have less invested in the pot, so are getting less of a price. So, it makes sense that people are less active from the small blind, and you will get nets who actually fold the small blind like 92% of the time, or something like that. But these are, again, just general guidelines. Generally, a high attempt 
a high fold blinds to steal which is a stat I think you should have on your HUD, it's a very useful stat, but that's going to be a reliable indicator that your opponent is in net and should be categorised as such. Um, bear in mind that a net's aggression factor may actually be quite high. Like, an aggression factor is typically seen as a sign of someone being a bit more aggro, a bit more out of line, because they're betting more. But remember that all the aggression factor is, is like a ratio of how much someone bets to how much they call. Um, so if someone's betting like all the time and calling sort of an average amount of time they're going to have a high aggression factor but the net is like very very rarely calling so even if he's just betting like a few times the times when he happens to have a good hand because he's hardly ever calling bets he's hardly ever playing pots without initiative and stuff like that his aggression factor is still going to be quite high assuming he likes c-bets as a preflop raiser and also remember the net just has a very strong range so you know the net might c-bet like 75% of the time and might have an aggression factor of 3.5 and you might say to yourself wow that's really aggressive he c-bets a lot and he just bets a lot in general with that AF um, it's not actually an indicator that he's particularly aggressive as such it's more just that he's opening if he's a net you know if he's running like 17-12 he's just opening such a small range of hands before the flop that he connects much better with most boards like if he flops a pair it's usually top pair so he's always betting a few streets and you know he has a lot of over pairs in his range anyway and assuming he's aware enough to see bet then you can quickly see how all these situations are going to add up and the net's actually going to have quite a high aggression factor even though he plays very tight and sort of basic and fair or fold for the most part um, if you use the stat went to showdown I don't think it's like completely necessary but it's again another Another fairly reliable indicator that your opponent's net is just if he never never really gets to showdown because he's always folding before the flop or if he does have a hand and starts betting his opponents are always folding because no one pays off a net, right? So generally a net is just always going to have a very low went to showdown percentage and a very high, um, conversely, a very high won at showdown percentage because he's really just only going to showdown with the best hand for the most part. But he's losing so much money in the red line, you know, Obviously the times the net shows down, he's going to win a lot of money, so his blue line is going to be really good. But he's losing so, so many blinds and so many raises and just things like that from folding too much that his red line is catastrophically bad and that's why a net is going to be a losing player. It's generally just due to the red line. So those are the stats of a net, um, how we can sort of pinpoint one. It might seem kind of obvious, but it's good to sort of talk about, especially if you're new to 6 max or whatever, it's good to talk about what ranges of stats mean what. Because sixteen fourteen is like fairly regish stats for a um a player at full ring. But anyway, let's move on to observable behaviors. So obviously, it goes without saying. Hopefully, the net is just folding a lot in general. You know, if you're playing live or if you're playing a couple of tables without a hard and you're just paying attention, you're just going to notice that you're never playing a pot with a certain person. And obviously, from that, you can just infer that they're net. Um, snap folding blinds without thought. This is a good one because there's a difference between someone who's just tight out of the blinds and then someone who's just thoughtlessly tight out of the blinds. Like you may get a tight regular who folds a certain amount of hands out of the blinds but then will always think right that guy's stealing a lot I'm gonna play back at him and we'll always have that other gear to sort of switch into. However with nets you'll find that they just instantly fold continuously out of the blinds like there's no thought it's just like oh that's not one of the hands I play fold and when it's that quick and when it's that automatic and there's just no sign of them adapting to what you're doing, you know, if you're stealing like every single time, small blind versus big blind, then if you don't see them do anything about it, you can pretty much say with safety that that person's a sort of mindless net who's just calling, calling down, sorry, who's just folding all their blinds without much thought. Um, so pay attention to timing and stuff like that and also lack of adjustment over the long run. There are very good signs that your opponent is very, very tight. They can also be known to play way too many tables. Like at 6 max, for instance, if you look someone up and they're playing sort of like 20 tables and they look quite tight, they're almost certainly just like a net. And you get a lot of these guys at 5NL, 10NL, like even 2NL, just players who don't really need to do anything other than play a very very nitty ABC game because there are so many stations and crazy fish and just recreational players splashing about not really understanding what they're doing 
that it actually is profitable for them to sit down and only play premium hands and just play in this very face-up obvious nitty way. Um, and that sort of takes you on to the next the next point. These multi-tablers, these nits who just mass table the micros, they're going to be playing a very, very generic game. And it's very obvious to note when that's happening because firstly their stats are just going to be extremely tight and you're just never ever going to see them show down without like a strong hand. You're never going to see them get a bit creative or bluff a flop. Like if they raise post flop they have it. If they raise pre flop it's a tight range. You know, the most out of line they'll ever get is to C bet and they might not even do that, some of these guys at the at the very lowest stakes. So for any of you playing like five NL or ten NL, um I think these guys are like as good as it gets when it comes to nets. They're just so automatic and robotic that they'll just never adjust to you for the most part. So these guys it's like playing against machines and you can basically just take a whole lot of lines from them. Um, we'll get on to how to, you know, actually exploit these players in a minute, but yeah. I wish there were still nets like that, like the guy that ran 5-2, the guy that runs 4-1 at 100 NL, that'd be very nice. Lots of free blinds. So, you'll also notice a reluctance to bluff, like I was saying, like a net, if a net raises you on the flop, you're pretty much just certain that he has it, even if he's only repping a few combos of sets, he probably still has it. So a net will be very reluctant to bluff if you see someone just very straightforward, never check raise and flops, never 3-bet and pre-flop, you know, that's another good indication. And we can also categorize a net by someone who is very reluctant to value bet thinly. Like, players have different relative standards as to what's a strong hand that can be value bet. Like, obviously the best players just know, they have a feel for whether their hand is strong enough to value bet, and so when the situation calls for a thin value bet, they'll make it, and when the situation calls for there being no value they'll check back. Whereas the net will be more inclined just to have a sort of set list of what hands are good enough to bet on what streets. So, you know, a, a good indication that someone's very nitty is if, you know, they open the button, you call out the big blind, say. Let's say the flop comes down like Jack 5 2 and they bet the flop and you call, so you've got like Queen Jack. They bet the turn and you call and then you check the river to them and they check back Ace Jack or something like that. Like they check back a hand that to most people, or to any sort of thinking regular, would be a sort of slam dunk bet for three streaks of value kind of hand. So, certainly another observable behaviour of the net is a strange reluctance to value bet thinly, which kind of makes sense in a way because people are going to be folding a lot more and people aren't paying them off. That said, when the net has the best hand 100% of the time and he's like checking back the river, it just doesn't really make any sense, and you will notice that. Not just from net, so a lot of players in the micro stakes especially, who just regulars especially, like one of the biggest leaks of regs in the micros is they just don't value bet thin enough and nets are absolutely you know the top criminals at this offence. So that's it for observable behaviours and um, we've talked about how we can identify these players. So now we'll move on to the next stage and talk about how we should actually adapt to them and you know change our game and our lines so as to be as plus EV against these guys as we can be. So what we want to do firstly is to steal as wide as we possibly can. If you have a net in your big blind or in your small blind and you're in the button, like even if the other blind is kind of a bit looser, it still makes it the case that you want to widen up your button range as much as you can. If you have like two nets in the blinds, you want to be stealing any two cards. Again, if you're in the small blind and you have a, a net in the big blind who just isn't playing back at you and it's just really tight, say so it's like, you know, 14, 10 guy that's folding 87% of his blinds to steals, then there's nothing wrong with opening any two cards and then even if we have to check fold post flop, like it would still be mega profitable because we're just taking it down like 85% of the time plus pre flop. So you can imagine if we're say the blinds are like <clears throat> just for simplicity, um one and two, if we are like risking six, say we make it six to take down what's in there, um in that case we'd be putting in six bucks to potentially win the three plus or six back, which is six into nine, which means that that has to work sort of two thirds of the time. So it has to work like 40% of the time or something like that for it to be plus EV immediately and it's working like 85% of the time. So basically when it comes to pre-flop against someone who's folding their blinds that much, there's just really no limit to the amount of combos we can open like blind versus blind, button versus blinds, basically in spots and late position 
where we don't have someone else to interfere with us. Obviously, we shouldn't be like opening up under the gun just because we have nets in the blinds because our race has to get through like three other people first. But in late position, certainly we can go a bit crazy. That brings me on to the next point. Um, if we have like a netty button, <clears throat> that actually upgrades your cutoff spot positionally. So your cutoff actually becomes a button because the guy on the button is just folding so so often that like 80%, 90% of the time your cutoff is the button. Like there are actually only two players to get through because the guy on the button folds so much. You see what I mean? So you can also be aware that when you have a net on the button that you can sort of um, change your cutoff range to very near what your button range would be normally against whoever's in the blinds because the net's just folding so much. He's basically giving you his button too much. It's another way in which he's making a mistake and it's another way in which you can exploit him. Um, you want to think about your sizing as well, preflop against netty players. It often doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be 3xing and certainly not like 3.5 or 4xing against nets in late position. If you're Again, if you're under the gun you've got loads of other players to get through as well, you don't want to give everyone a great price and min raise, but if you're under button or the cutoff and you've got nets all around you, then you probably want to like make a min raise, especially if you're on the button and the nets aren't adjusting. Because here's the thing, if a net does call you or 3-bet you out the blinds, you're usually going to lose that hand. Like you're, Especially if they 3-bet you, you're going to be folding like an enormous amount of the time when you open the button. Reason being, you're opening the button really, really wide, right? So of course you have to fold a lot when the net actually 3-bets you because you just have everything in your range. So. If that's the case, then your money is really just coming from the times that the net folds. It's all about stealing, it's all about fold equity, it's red line money basically. So if the net's still going to fold 2.5x or even 2x the big blind, it makes no sense to burn that extra money the certain times that the net does actually 3-bet you or flat you. So what you're doing is you're still hopefully achieving the same result because the net's not very good at adjusting, he hates to play out of position. So he's not going to flat you anymore, so by min raising or whatever on the button with your jack 6 offsuit, you're hopefully still achieving the same result, you know, getting folds like 85% of the time against the robotic net. So that said, we can sort of conclude that we just don't need to be 3xing in, the, in these spots. Another very big leak that people have at the micros preflop is that they just their preflop sizing is far too generic. So they'll be inclined to just always 3x in late position in the cutoff in the button. And against nets or people who just fold a lot or 3-bet, basically. If it's someone who 3-bets or folds, which is the case with the load of nets who hate the flat out position, then you should make your open less because that means that they're making a mistake. Because when they're 3-betting, you, you sort of lose the minimum by making a smaller raise and then folding and you still take down the blinds all the rest of the time so you're just saving money those few times that you actually get played back at or whatever so if the net actually starts to adjust you know if you start min raising then you find that he's like flatting all the time that actually means he's probably playing quite well pre-flop if he's taking advantage of like really good odds and stuff <clears throat> he's playing a bit of a wider range against your any two cards on the button then you need to up it again to sort of 2.5 or 3x and sort of find that biting point where the net is happy just to fold this whole range again. So it is a bit about sort of experimenting preflop with your sizing, finding what works. Obviously all nets are different. We can't just give someone a category and expect them to play exactly how we expect um, or how we would assume a net would play just because we've given them that label. <clears throat> it doesn't work like that exactly but it is likely that they won't adjust and in the majority of cases, especially the micros, you can get away with just like making very small opens preflop and still taking down the blinds a lot when you have these guys in your blinds so I definitely recommend being a bit more inventive and creative with your flop sizing if you're one of these guys who sort of just sticks to generic sizes. Everyone could do with thinking about sizing enough that's something I always say in all my videos. Okay my fourth point here <clears throat> is mine 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 and that's because against a net when the net actually shows some strength pre-flop like if they if they open, for instance, an early position, obviously they have a very strong range because it's not like the lag who's opening 25% under the gun, the net's probably opening like 6% under the gun. So if the net only has the top 6% of hands, when we flop a set or like a really strong hand against that, like a flush or straight or whatever, it's very likely that we make a lot of money because the net's range is strong. He has over pairs, he has top pair, and just because someone's netty pre-flop, it doesn't mean they can fold top pair, especially in the micros.
you get a lot of nits who are just very stationary. I think I talk about that in the next slide, so I'll maybe save that till then. But yeah, don't assume that a nit's capable of making loads of big folds post flop and that you shouldn't be able to set mine profitably because one of the best things you can do against these guys when they do actually show some strength before the flop is to play lots of hands like pocket threes, pocket sixes, ten nine suited, jack ten suited, hands that can flop really big and get their stack. So it's all about implied odds, implied odds, implied odds. Um, it follows from that that you should then sort of avoid hands with what we'd say are reverse implied odds like ace jack offsuit for anyone who's a bit unsure reverse implied odds are basically the opposite of implied odds so implied odds are where we're making a small investment before the flop with the chance of winning what's behind in our opponent's stack so the ratio that we're getting is not just the pot to our investment it's the potential stack of our opponent depending on how often we actually get that to our investment so that's implied odds. Reverse implied odds is when we're actually the ones that are losing portions of our stack after the flop. So we're making an investment, but then we have these reverse implied odds because even though we will win the pot sometimes when we make our hand, there are other times where we w where we lose a really big pot. So reverse implied odds are pretty dangerous against nits. You're commonly going to have a lot of reverse implied odds when you have a hand like ace jack, offsuit, you know, ace ten offsuit, king, queen offsuit. These kind of hands are like, I'm just picking the sort of pinnacles of reverse implied odds ridden hands right now, but a lot of hands can be reverse implied odds. Like basically hands that flop pairs that are dominated or flop sort of top pair when your opponent has lots of over pairs. These kind of situations. And <clears throat> as a good sort of rule of thumb, whenever you've got a lot of implied odds with your range, you probably have a whole lot of reverse implied odds with your range as well. And what that means is that you should favour the implied odds hands and reject the reverse implied odds hands. And that's why, just to summarise here against the net, you're much better off playing a hand like pocket eights, where it's easy to play, you can dump it very quickly before the flop if you miss, and if you do flop a straight, you, sorry, a set, you basically have the nuts and can take all the money from his pocket aces. So, <clears throat> hopefully that's clear enough. Post-flop, how do we take advantage of a net? So... The few times that a net does call our open, say we're pre-flop raiser and we're working out whether we want to see bet and I wouldn't say that see betting has no place at all against nets, you just have to be more careful. If the net's just calling out the blind with like the very best broadways and then good pairs and stuff and the board comes down like sort of 10, 8, 7, the net's going to flop the set or an over pair or top pair occasionally. He's going to have a very strong range in that board or maybe two overs with a flush draw if it's a two-tone board. So. On a flop like that, of course, with our very, very weak range, we need to be very selective about when we see bet. We need to be checking back sometimes for pot control, and we need to be just giving up the times we flop really bad equity or no equity. But that's not to say that there aren't spots where we can um, continuation bet against the net. For example, like really dry boards, if the net's flatting like all these pairs and it comes down sort of king, eight, two, rainbow, and he's just going to have missed that board with all his ace, queen, ace, jack, and then all his pocket pairs are going to fold because he's just a net, he doesn't want to play like pocket nines and that flop with the king out, then we can just make a c-bet and pick up the pot and it's very crucial that we're not automatically giving up just because someone with a strong range has called us because there are certainly boards that even strong ranges don't do very well on and those are like sort of king high ace high queen high dry boards, boards that are very good for the, the perceived pre-flop raiser and not so good for a whole bunch of pocket pairs basically, which is fundamentally what the net's going to have when he defends. Um, Usually we want to be sort of one and done, like if we fire a flop like queen, six, three, rainbow and get called, it's usually not like, without good reads, it's usually not too advisable to start firing multiple streets, because when the net does call the flop, usually he has like top air or a strong hand, and like I say, nets aren't necessarily capable of making big folds, so we shouldn't just be trying to make them fold their hand because we know they have tight tendencies pre-flop. I have seen nets who are just completely bonkers post-flop, or who are just really stationary, you know, they wait like an hour to play a hand like pocket aces, finally they get aces, they don't feel like folding it, like do they hell, come on, they're going to be like stacking off, getting all their money and that's what they're waiting for, that's why implied odds is so good, and set mining is so good, like I just talked about, um, but it also means that we shouldn't be trying to bluff them too much, we need to be strict with how much we're bluffing, C bet's fine, but we don't want to be firing multiple streets necessarily, because that could get us into a lot of trouble against a net with a strong hand who doesn't want to fold. That said, there are certainly people we can represent scare cards against. Like nets do have a tendency to sort of be afraid and sort of only play only play the best hands. The reason that they only want to play aces, kings, queens, ace, king, and that's because these hands they feel safe with them. 
So if we can get them into a situation where they feel unsafe, where they feel like they're in danger, for instance, like four through a straight comes out, three through a flush comes out, and we can just represent that card, provided you know that you've not got one of these really stationary nets. You can get a lot of full deck to post flop as well, but it does come down to, here's the disclaimer, as always, right? It does come down to knowing your opponent and knowing that they're able to actually fold and they're not a complete station. But provided your net is fairly tight post flop as well, flush cards are great to represent because nets always remember the times people make flushes against them and always sort of think, oh, he's going to have the flush and they always fold. Um, if they're the right kind of net. Again, I need to stress that. So, overcards can also help. You know, if the net has a lot of pocket pairs in his range, the flop is like jack 7 3 and you bet the flop as preflop raiser and the net calls and the turn comes a queen there's a lot of hands like pocket tens, pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sixes and stuff like that that the net can potentially have that are just going to have to fold now and remember the net isn't flatting very many jacks like he's not flatting queen jack, king jack suited these hands maybe ace jack and that's about it before the flop it depends on the position but if you can sort of take out all those top pair cards top pair hands from a net's range and sort of leaves them with like middling pocket pairs mostly, you know, Net's always going to be very concentrated with sort of hands like sixes through jacks when he calls an open. So given that, over cards are very unpleasant to Net's as well as flush cards, so when aces, kings, queens drop on the turn, you just want to be firing them and making the net fold his hand, you know, as a bluff. So there are plenty of situations where you can extract fold equity from a net post flop. But what I would just say is you need to be careful, you need to know that your net's not one of these guys that's just waiting to flop anything and then sort of stack off the few times he actually plays a pot. Um, again, like we've got the same sort of concept that work here as we talk, talked about and the pre-flop section, that we need to be very strict with calling down. Um, and that's because, again, there's a lot of reverse implied odds. Remember that a hand like ace-jack offsuit when a net opens in early position is basically trash because even when you flop top pair you're dominated a jack if you get a jack high flop you're dominated by queens through aces and if you get an ace high flop you're dominated by ace queen through ace king as well as aces so basically it's the kind of situation where you win a very small part or lose a big one and that's why sometimes you know we will get into situations although we don't purposely play a stack pre-flop against a net we might open it and a net might call but if the net's showing a lot of strength after the flop or you know the net's firing a lot of streets after the flop and we only have top pair we can often only call like one street against the net because they just don't barrel as a bluff they're just not aggressive like that they may see bet once and then be done with the hand but if they bet twice they have like top pair or top kicker minimum a lot of the time depends from net to net that's not a blanket statement of course but yeah we want to be very careful about what hands we call down with against this kind of player definitely because we just we take bluffs right out of their range and nets typically just don't get to the later streets with a hand that flops sort of, you know, mediocre value hands. Usually if they have a value hand that they're comfortable betting over multiple streets, it's a very strong one. And therefore if we have like top pair second kicker, although that's a great bluff catcher against many, many people and even beats a lot of people's value ranges in certain spots against the net, it's a bluff catcher and, all the, and that's all it is. And it's a bluff catcher against a range that contains close to zero bluffs. So that's why you need to be very careful about what you actually call down with over multiple streets and stuff like that. Um, just to give you an example of a situation, I've played a few hands like this, like Hero has jacks and say we raise we raise preflop and the net makes like a really small 3 bet, like 2.5 times our raise. We're in the cutoff, so he's in the big blind, so he makes it we make it 3 times the big blind and he makes it like 7.5 times the big blind, so we're 100 big blinds deep. So we want to call with jacks because although the net may only 3 bet like 2%, we know we've got odds to set mine. Again, mine, 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 implied odds like we talked about. So we're always flatting there. And jacks is often good the times the net's 3 betting with like ace king or maybe even ace queen, but probably ace king. Um, So we know that the net's not going to put loads of pressure on his post flop. He's going to maybe fire a C bet and then give up. So it should be very easy for us to show down jacks the times they are good and the times there an overcard comes in the flop we're just going to let them go and the only time we're going to stack off is if we flop a set basically so with this plan we go into the flop and we call and the flop comes 10-6-2 which is the board that we're pretty happy to see the net goes ahead and bets like say three fifths pot on the flop and we call again going through with our plan that the net's going to have ace king here 
Um, he's not always going to have Queen's Plus and he's going to see bet and stuff like that and we're getting a good price on the flop so we make a call there which is okay if we knew it was really really tight and didn't even have ace king or didn't even see bet with it we could just fold but we don't know that we peel one street then the net bets the turn and a huge mistake that people tend to make in this spot is just to think too much about their absolute hand strength and not enough about their relative hand strength relative to the net's range because of course jacks on this board when the nits fired two is probably completely crushed because the nits just gonna have queens plus and nothing else or maybe a set of tens and we really can't put stuff like ace king or bl other bluffs in his range anymore because he's not the kind of player he's far too nitty to three bet preflop and then fire two streets as a bluff post flop so jacks is basically just to be dumped on any turn that isn't a jack in this situation after we call the flop Okay, cool. So yeah, be careful about how light you're willing to call down against the net. Reverse implied odds are bad. Alright, that's the end of my slide. So what I'm going to do now is cut to my little holder manager replayer here. And we're going to talk a little bit about the stats of the guy to our right here. This is a 100 NL table on stars who is called Phantom Mo. I don't know if that's his full name, I don't think it is, I think it's Phantom Mojo, who cares, whatever. Don't want to like name and shame the guy necessarily, so yeah, Phantom Mojo is his name, I can see it there actually. Duh. So, this guy here is obviously like a, a regular of some sort. He has taggy stats on first appearance, so he's like 21-16, he steals 33%, so from the button, you know, he's stealing like 43% of buttons. He's not someone we typically call a net, however, he is still a net of sorts. And I'll explain why and why we need to sort of view him as in it and why he's a good guy for us to have um, to our immediate right like that. And the reason is basically that although his VPEP and preflop raised 21 and 16 are not that low, he's very, very nitty in other ways. For instance, his aggression factor is very, very low, which when you're playing that many hands, it just sort of shows that he's very fit or fold because he's getting into a lot of situations in late position and then he's just hardly ever betting, he's just losing a lot of pots. Um, the C bet percentage of 14 is insanely low, of course there'll be a bit of variance in there, there's no way anyone only C bets 14%, but it's still seriously low. His fold to C bet of 63% is very very high, so we know he's folding, he's very fit or fold. So far we've got this read that he's very fit or fold and straightforward. But then we look at his fold blinds to steal stats, 86 from the small blind and 94% from the big blind. Like, that's huge. So, I would actually tag this guy green, which is my colour for nets, because he is nowhere near like a, a normal regular 100 NL. Like, this has to go relative to your stakes. Like, if you're playing 5 NL, you'd probably tag this guy as a reg, because he's. There are many, many nettier players um, who aren't positionally aware at all and aren't stealing wide and just aren't anywhere near 2116. They're running like 10 7. So, you probably want to reserve the net tags to them. However,. When you move up, you have to drop your standards of what sort of game you're willing to sit in. You have to be a bit more lenient with your table selection because you just can't find as good a table as you can at the lower stakes. So a guy like this is actually like pretty much bread and butter net for me. I'm going to sit on his left. Um, yeah, I'm going to sit on his left and I have him to my right basically, and I'm going to be just stealing his blind continuously. And I'm going to be doing it a bit smaller as well, like, like I talked about, our sizing here should be less. So let's just have a quick look at this hand, just to sort of go over what I mean here. So we open to $2 on the button, which I think is good. This guy is an unknown in the big blind, however there are still loads of people at 100 NL that I'd be happy just min raising against if they're like 3 betters, or they're folding their blind all the time and not adjusting, which is fairly common. So. Given that I know this guy's tight and I don't know really anything about the big blind yet, I'm content just min raising. Like if I had, if I was just against him, and we were like heads up or whatever, I'd always be making my opens really small because he's just folding far, far too much. If he starts adjusting and flatting a lot when I make it two dollars, then I'll just up again and capitalize on all the folds I'm going to get from this 94% fold big blind to steal stat. But yeah, if this is a guy that I'd always be min raising or 2.5 xing against, it'd be a bit of a mistake to make it any bigger. So we get called in two spots in this hand. The board comes down Jack four three rainbow. So what do we think of this board? There's a few things to think. Like the first question is 
how often is our C bet, how likely is our C bet to get through two people in this flop? And it's fairly likely. I wouldn't say it's like gonna maybe about half the time our C bet will get through here. Because when we min raise, remember that this am I gonna try and say this really? Ba ba bob ba ba bob H is gonna be flatting with a very 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 wide range because he's getting like a billion to one because when I've put in two bucks and Phantom Mode has thrown in two bucks there's only one more dollar for him to call and see a flop with like any two suited card any two connectors and stuff it's conceivable that this guy would be coming along so that said he doesn't have a whole lot of pairs in his range he also doesn't have that many jacks compared to just all the random stuff so the majority of the time our C bet is going to get through this guy right Phantom Moja is very tight, we know he's very fit or fold, he's probably not going to call here with pocket 8s when he's sandwiched in between two people um, on a jack high board, so we can make him fold almost all of his range, he probably doesn't have that many jacks because remember he's a net out the blinds, so like we said before the net just doesn't flat that many hands that can make top pair, the net's mainly flatting more sort of hands that can, more hands like sort of pocket 7s through 10s, maybe pocket 5s through 10s or something like that. And maybe the best broadway is like ace-queen and maybe ace-jack and king-queen. But out of those, the vast majority of that is just having to fold here when he's sandwiched between the two of us. Baba, Bo, Baba Bob H is having to fold because his range is very wide and he's missed his flop. And we have a gut shot and we have an overcard. And we just have a very, very plus EVC bet here basically. So I just wanted to sort of use this guy's nitty tendencies and the situation created by our min raise pre-flop. These are all relevant factors and both of them mean that these guys will be folding quite a lot. So they probably fold more than 50% of the time. They probably both fold like over 50% of the time. And what that means is that our C-bet is immediately profitable even if we pot it because a pot size C-bet needs to work half the time. However, we're not going to pot it. We're going to make it smaller than that so it needs to work even less. And on a dry board there's no reason to make it big. So we make it like 350 into 6, less than 2 thirds needs to work sort of less than 40% of the time, maybe like 35% of the time, it's going to work probably over 50 and even the times it, does, it doesn't work we still have equity so that raw figure of like 35% success rate that we need that's assuming we have no equity but we do have equity, we have 4 outs and deuces I mean drawing a 2 there for some reason as if that actually helps you guys visualize it 4 outs and 2's and our aces are likely outs a good amount of the time although not always so we probably have like two of our three ace outs just to sort of represent how often they're good and then we have our four deuce outs. We still have like six outs which is nice. So yeah I'd definitely always be see in this spot and note that our sizing preflop is based on this guy's nitty tendencies. And this guy although he looks somewhat like a reg I'd definitely tag him as a net and it's important to see that he has a lot of the characteristics as an, of a net. And what I really want to illustrate with that just to summarize is that it's very it's not black and white whether someone is a net or isn't someone may have very nitty tendencies that you need to adapt to such as he folds his blinds too much and we know that we target a net splines because the net folds too much so we hold this sort of net category in our head as a guideline and sort of do the same thing as we do against the net because he's netty note the adjective he's netty out the blind so that's one area in which he is a net however when he opens from the button we don't want to be like flatting or he opens from the cutoff, we don't want to be flatting pocket sixes and trying to, you know, mine a set there because his range is actually really wide there and he's not nitty in that respect. So the danger is that I'm trying to illuminate for you guys is that you can't just label someone net, and this will come up time and time again in this series, you can't just label, label someone X and then just do everything by the book on how you play against that player because everyone is different and a lot of people are very nitty in some ways and not in others very aggro in some ways and not in others and you just have to pay attention and take notes and this guy here very much falls into the category for me of being a net but I need to remember the few ways that he's not nitty in is when he's opening the pot himself basically in every other aspect of the game he's very nitty so yeah it's not always black and white and you need to remember what aspects of people's games you're sort of putting into these categories and of course you will get guys who are 100% just you know by the book prime example nets who just have all those things going for them that we talked about in the slides and you'll get guys who are just by the book stations by the book maniacs by the book regs but you'll get a lot of players in between it's a spectrum of players and categorizing players is finding where they best fit in the spectrum and if possible find each player their sort of unique place in the spectrum there'll be some that are so obvious you'll put them in you know just as a net or just as a fish 
or whatever, but other ones, you try and find them their right slot in the spectrum and work out what ways you need to be playing against them as if they're a net and what ways you shouldn't do that. Okay? So hopefully that was kind of illustrative. I know it wasn't the most exciting of hands, but I just sort of wanted to talk about this player and just I basically took a random guy from my database and decided to ask the question how would I categorize this guy because this is what the videos are all about and that's the answer as a net but I need to be aware that when he's opening I can't play against him as if he's a net in that situation he's like half he's like a third reg two thirds net hybrid super hybrid mutant okay so I hope you've enjoyed this opening video of the series adjusting to player types I shall be um, bringing you the next one of this very soon as you can see here and next time we're going to talk about why I love stations that's going to be a short and the one after that is going to be how we deal with short stacks and what kind of adjustments we make and etc etc so this has been characters for grinder school adjusting to player types leave me questions or comments I'm really intrigued to see what you guys think about the new series hopefully you like it hopefully you like this idea of bringing you guys big packages so you can become experts in certain things Questions or comments about how to play against nets, all welcome below, and I'll see you guys soon for the next installment. Thanks very much.